we see that the uh, ICT products and even telecom services are increasingly used e either by human rights defenders, but also by those who, who seek to repress citizens uh, and, and people uh, in countries like Iran and, and throughout the world, actually. And it's very important that we know exactly how these uh, ICT tools are used because they can be used for both good and bad. So the more we know about the direct connection between repression uh, and the individual, the more we can uh, ensure that transparency and accountability are ensured and the better we can make policy decisions. There's actually still a lot of gray area in the policy field around the use of ICT and, and the defense of human rights. And so I think we need to make sure that there's more knowledge, more transparency on the part of companies. Uh, and I think we should consider a few policy decisions. So one, uh, we can look at including certain very uh, repressive and hard, uh, hardcore um, ICT products such as security uh, tools that uh, do surveillance, that do tracking and tracing of individuals uh, when they are exported to governments or uh, state companies of which we know that they violate human rights. And uh, this could be done by including certain products in the standard list that is used when an embargo uh, is brought upon a country, such as uh, we see by uh, the US, the EU, and the UN in the case of Iran. Uh, these lists usually include military equipment, but we have to acknowledge that certain ICT products now are actually as effective as weapons. Uh, and I think that that could be a way to change our policies. I also think we should consider doing human rights impact assessments on product at an earlier stage. So usually human rights impact assessments are done before trade agreements are made or before export agreements uh, uh, are done. But perhaps we should move this uh, process forward and already start in the R&D phase so that we're not constantly running behind the ball but that we can actually get ahead and make sure that we know what's going on and can make the right decisions to uh, protect human rights. Well, when we address Nokia Siemens networks for their providing of a mobile service network to the government of Iran or to the state-owned uh, mobile company, which was effectively in the hands uh, of the decision makers and those who repressed citizens in Iran, um, they said that they did not break any rules and that they did not act against the sanction regime that was in place then. Uh, but we also know that companies create spin-offs in order to act uh, and operate under different names sometimes. And uh, they are usually not very open about this. So it is not immediately obvious which links and connections exist between EU-based companies or US-based companies, for that matter, and um, spin-offs on the ground. So I think we should uh, investigate that more deeply and get more clarity on that so that we know who can be held accountable and so that we can actually also monitor the enforcement of sanctions and uh, assess whether they are actually uh, causing the result that we would like. Because in the case of Iran, we've seen a lot of broad economic sanctions to um, try to get a change regarding the nuclear issue. But recently, and I think this is a very positive development, there are more and more very targeted sanctions against individuals who are responsible for human rights violations. Now, the U European Commission has said that this is their approach, that they are going to hold accountable individuals. But I think that we also must look at the companies that are providing uh, the tools that can be used and that are used as weapons against people uh, when they are uh, ICT products. And uh, we shouldn't be naive about this. Uh, and we must hold uh, corporations uh, accountable when human rights are violated with their uh, tools. And at least we need to know what's going on in order to make the right policy decisions. The bigger picture is absolutely important. I mean, Iran has been the focus of attention for many of us, but there are so many countries in which serious violations of human rights happen with the help of ICTs. Um, in Syria, a few months before uh, the street protests began, uh, the government did a serious attack on its citizens. And I believe it's a lack of knowledge on the part of European policymakers that uh, causes a late response to this or even a lack of a response at all. But if you uh, would imagine that this kind of attack would take place in the form of, let's say, burning books in the street, everybody would, would think that this is a very serious attack on citizens, free speech, press freedom, uh, or access to information for that matter. But when it happens online and with technologies, it's not always clear to people what is happening exactly. 
Uh, and so we also need to uh, get better knowledge on the part of decision makers. But there are countless countries. Uh, Tunisia was known as one of the worst uh, censoring, tracking and blocking countries uh, before the revolution took place there. In Egypt there were serious problems, but also in countries like Burma. Uh, in China, uh, we know very well that there are problems, but there are a number of countries where there's kind of a gray area, where it's not a blanket policy, but where there's bits and pieces that actually violate the rights of people. And even in our own societies, we have to be very, very careful that we don't create a slippery slope because um, there are uh, regulations regarding uh, so-called lawful interception. So the way in which legally uh, police and law enforcement can, can intercept uh, in email or mobile uh, communications. But increasingly we see a push to increase uh, the scope of um, interception. And I think that is a very dangerous um, development, which will also lead to less credibility on the part of the EU and the US. Because for example, if it is possible to uh, block or take down certain websites when there's undesired content, such as uh, uncopyright, um, uncopyrighted or not uncopyrighted, but materials over which copyright has not been paid, or uh, where there's a question about whether it's hate speech or not, uh, then th we create a very slippery slope where uh, from illegal to undesired content is not always clear and where private companies get a growing responsibility, uh, intermediary liability or self-regulation to monitor and possibly take down uh, websites and traffic. And I think that that's a very dangerous development which will go at the expense of our credibility in the rest of the world. Well, there's uh, always the question of how much should be regulated. And I'm definitely not a fan of over-regulating, but I do believe it's very important that we're credible and that we practice what we preach when it comes to the defense of human rights, which we consider universal and in which uh, the EU has a great responsibility. So um, I think we should do more. And there are, of course, companies who, who do not uh, want to see this happening because it's actually part of their business model. And these are well-known companies. Uh, I've spoken to a number of them and uh, first of all it's very difficult for them to even acknowledge that they have a responsibility in uh, the protection and defense of human rights. Uh, for example, when I spoke with representatives of uh, Vodafone about Egypt, uh, that was a very difficult conversation uh, about who is the victim and, and who, who is an actor in that, uh, in that situation. The same when we address Nokia Siemens networks. Uh, those are difficult conversations. Uh, of course, uh, companies like Intel and Cisco have uh, acquired also uh, a lot of cybersecurity um, parts, and it's a business model. So uh, I can imagine that those are sometimes conflicting interests, but it's not the first time that we have to deal with conflicting interests here. And uh, there are ways to be specific and to make sure um, that we don't um, target companies in an uh, undesired way, but that we do take our responsibility. And I think companies should also be a part of that uh, responsibility, because in the end, if you look at the bigger picture, uh, free societies in the end will allow for more and more diverse trade also uh, benefiting Western companies. Well, there's no lack of ability to do something, but we have to continuously assess how ICT and tel telecom use, services, products impact the lives of people for good and sometimes uh, as a threat. And we have to adjust our policies if necessary. <clears throat> and in the case of Iran, we have sanction packages in place. They are mostly aimed uh, at the nuclear issue, which uh, is very important and it's at the same time, unfortunately, very questionable what results these broad economic sanctions actually have. But then we see a trend where there are increased um, targeted sanctions on individuals which uh, the EU or the US uh, hold accountable for human rights violations. And in the same line of thought, I think we should be very targeted uh, about ICT uh, use when it comes to uh, human rights violations and we should hold companies accountable. And it also means we have to constantly update our own knowledge about how uh, companies operate, whether <coughs> the sanction, pack sanction packages uh, cover a sufficient amount of product or whether we should revise. So we have to constantly update ourselves on the facts on the ground. And those are not always easy to acquire and they are certainly not always provided by these companies. And I think it is time for more pressure 
uh, for transparency and for accountability when it comes to these um, products and services. Well, it's very important that we look at the standards by which technologies are produced and the context within which they'll be used. And also this context constantly changes. But we have a lot of technologies which are based on uh, the context of the rule of law, uh, of uh, checks and balances, of an independent police force and, and uh, law enforcement uh, and judicial branch which is not the case in many places. So it's important to look at the context and also the changing context in certain countries. And when there's evidence of governments uh, cracking down on citizens in the way that we've seen in so many countries in the recent months, in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Syria, in Bahrain, in Iran, um, it, it's, it's becoming a trend and these governments are learning from each other. So um, we must look at those tools uh, that allow for um, spying and breaking into people's private communications, for uh, locating individuals, for tapping into their, their conversations with the goal of uh, figuring out who is uh, speaking to whom, what the context of their conversations are, and perhaps even tracing people in the streets to disperse uh, small groups of people. I mean, these are very, very intrusive uh, technologies and uh, uh, they require updated know-how, not only the hardware, but also the consulting. And so we should look at the full uh, scope of these products and also the full impact within uh, the context of these uh, repressive regimes and the companies that they may use to repress, because it's not always governments directly repressing people, but they may also uh, work through uh, spin-offs and different structures to, uh, to uh, avoid uh, sanction regimes, etc. So we must be very vigilant and keep our eye on the ball. But the problem is uh, that on the one hand, a lot of decision makers lack the deep technical knowledge or knowledge about the impact of these technologies to, to get a full uh, scope and a full assessment of what's actually going on.